Let's get started. Uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome, uh, Turkey Day Eve. Um, for those of you who celebrate Thanksgiving, um, thanks for joining on the day before. Uh, I don't know, maybe you didn't have a better place to be than here on Zoom with me drinking wine, but here we are. I'm, I'm glad you're here. So uh, we are facing this guy today. This is a non-vintage. Uh, actually, it's not true. This is actually a 2018. I know that this is a all 2018 vintage. I just don't know if they have it written on the label. Um, so this is a 2018 Pastel Liage Aurelia Gran Reserva Cava is what we're drinking today. So it looks like this. There's a name, Aurelia, written on the front. Um, super cool stuff. Uh, the for those of you who request to have your wines delivered before Thanksgiving, I did all of them today. I literally got home like 15 minutes ago, so it's, I apologize if I seem a little frazzled. Uh, but it was a long day, but I got them all out. So if you have requested it and you have not gotten your wines, that means either I fucked up and did not put you on my route or you fucked up and did not tell me in between. But we can figure this out. So if you have, just let me know. Um, I have some time tomorrow in the morning. Uh, whether I can, but Zach is closed at this point. So I don't have an access to the wines, but I may have some, anyways, we may be able to figure it out. So if you, if that is a case, do let me know. Uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll figure out if we can make this happen uh, before tomorrow. Besides that, I don't really have any other announcement. Um, just that this month we are donating to Action Against Hunger. 1% uh, of our gross revenue gets donated to an organization every month, a uh, different organization every month. And this month I'm featuring Action Against Hunger, um, especially in times of Thanksgiving. We're about to go into some feast and festivities. Um, I think it's good to remind ourselves that there are still people um, there's still hunger is still an issue that we haven't solved as a humanity. So this organization does incredible work. Uh, but more than anything, uh, a lot of these organizations I feature actually, uh, people are asking how I chose them. Um, there's a like a watch list, I guess a charity watch list uh, organization. Um, they basically go and rank them depending on how much of the money actually goes to the work as opposed to overhead. Um, and that I choose from the list that resonate with me in terms of causes that have 85% uh, or above going to the programming uh, details uh, rather than going to a um, overhead. So these are all kind of uh, organizations that have been vetted by some other watchdog organizations. So that's how I choose them. Um, and if you'd like to donate alongside the Sex of the White Club, it's right there uh, in the chat box. Cool. Um, all the... The enrollment for next month has been wrapped up uh, at this point. Uh, I do have a couple more wines actually left. If you are on the fence or you were on the fence, but you want to get back in, or if you know, uh, if you have a friend you want to give to, whatever, I have about like three sets left actually extra. So let me know, and then I can still get through it. But outside of that, we're pretty much all wrapped up for next month. And if you haven't heard, next month the theme is going to be what I call do you even go here box? It's basically all the satellite underdog far flung places in France where nobody goes to. It's like, you're gonna look at the Appalachian name and you're like, where the fuck is that? Um, oftentimes I had to do that as well. Uh, Cause I had no idea where those were. Uh, so these are kind of like the, all the uh, fly under the radar kind of regions and places. Um, and we're gonna go there next month. So that's what I, that's what we have in store next month, but. Yeah, that's it. Any questions about anything before we get into the wine? Cool. Hearing none. Let's go to the map. All right. We are in Spain. In case you did not know, Cava is a sparkling wine that's made in Spain. Cava is not a particularly regional or geographical destination. It's more of actual um, production method designation, even though 
certain areas they don't allow it, but it's basically they don't have a just one area that is Cava Dio. Cava Dio is spread all around, mostly centered around Catalonia, which is all the way in the northeastern part of Spain, butting up right against France. This is where Barcelona is. Just to give you some sort of an idea of where in Spain we are. Um, Catalonia or Catalonia, it is, uh, with, especially within that, uh, Penedes, which really doesn't show here. Oh, here you go. Yeah, this Penedes right here. This is basically the epicenter of kava production. Quote unquote, the best, the highest quality, the most sought after kavas come from right here in Penedes. Having said that, it can, the, there's kava dio uh, that's, um, that's made in Navarra, as well as Rioja, uh, as well as in Aragon. Um, so kava can be made in multiple different places within Spain, uh, but know that most likely what you're gonna find. And this is the most, the majority of it is made here and the best is made here. So Catalonia, Penedes is basically uh, what we're talking about when we're talking about the best cava. And indeed, this wine does come from Catalonia. This wine does come from Penedes uh, and within this area. And as you can imagine, this butts up right up against the ocean, the Mediterranean Ocean, right? Um, and there's this mountain, I mean, Pyrenees is basically what divides France and Spain, right? But there's a mountain range that comes down on the backside, on the western side of Catalonia. Um, so even within Penedes, it gets kind of divided into, depending on its uh, altitude. So one of the things that kava is really good at, or one thing about kava, is that you can really, by tasting kava from three different, these regions, sub-regions, so there's a Baja, uh, Penedes. This comes from Alta Penedes, which is the highest elevation. Um, so basically, imagine going from the sea level going up to the mountain. So there's this elevation change. So there's a three kind of different areas, subregions within Penedes as well. But obviously, the most sought after one is coming from the steep slopes up in the mountains and the highest elevation. A lot of times, it's because we've been talking about this month, but sparkling wine really you need that acid to really keep it that real, um, the precision and then the the backbone of the wine. So obviously, higher you go up in the elevation, colder it gets, which means more natural acidity. So, and oftentimes the the soil tends to be poorer, um, less fertile, which is also a good thing for uh, wines in terms of bringing up minerality and then complexity and, and structure. So yeah, we're talking about Alto Penedes and that's where we are with this wine. But as you can imagine, being right next to uh, the huge body of water, there's a lot of maritime influence here. So kind of Mediterranean climate, a lot like California, Northern California kind of a thing, where it's a mild summer, mild winter, uh, uh, rain com coming in in the winter time, uh, that the temperature ranges and UV ray exposure also ranges depending on where you are in that. But yeah, that's where we are this month. Uh, let's see, who makes this wine? So I've been working with Castellage for, I don't even know how long, a very long time. I, mean, I adore their wines. Um, I think their wines are very, very precise, very technically correct. Um, but they also are very expressive. It's not just kind of a commodity kind of a wine, uh, which I really uh, imp uh, appreciate. But the story of Castellage is actually a story of three generations of matriarchs, three women, uh, three generations of women uh, in the family. It all started with this lady, Aurelia uh, Figuera, uh, which is what this uh, kava is named after. We're gonna talk about this in a sec, but there's a uh, different quali uh, quality levels or it, it all depends on the aging requirement, but on the top being Gran Reserva, on, in the middle being Reserva, and the bottom being just base level traditional cava, uh, young cava. And the oldest one is named after the oldest generation, which is Aurelia. And then the second generation is named, uh, the Reserva, Gran Reserva is named after Aurelia, which is what we are tasting today. And then here's Olivia, and then here's Anne-Marie. Um, so the Reserva is named Anne-Marie, named after Anne-Marie. And then the regular Cava is, unfortunately it's not named Olivia, it's just named Pasolayage Cava. But 
maybe she will work up her name and one day uh, their family will make a wine that's named after her. But uh, so these are three ladies that basically um, run or have run this family um, winery, uh, all started by the grandmother right here. I mentioned Aurelia. Um, she was she's the first one who kind of took over family land. Uh, their family has owned this land for like 50 years, um, for over 50 years uh, when she took over. Uh, but they were not necessarily really farming anything, which is kind of abandoned land. And then she's the one who kind of reinvigorated by back farming, uh, planted vines. Um, and then, I mean, there were some vines already on there, but they were not really being actively being farmed. So she's the one who kind of reinvigorated the whole thing. And then Anne Marie. Uh, the second one, she's actually Swiss by birth. She came in, married into the family, uh, came in, and she's the one who actually established, uh, pu really pushed the um, farming into organic. And as well as uh, she's the one who built out the family winery, the cellar. Uh, so before that, it was just farming. And then with her during the family at the end of 1980s, uh, they built this family cellar and then they started making wine on their own instead of just selling the fruit. And then finally, Olivia is here. Here's another picture of Olivia. Um, she's a daughter of Anne-Marie and granddaughter of, Am uh, of uh, uh, Aurelia. Uh, and then she's a current generation that's kind of taking over and then continuing the tradition. She's the one who's really pushing the family land into biodynamic farming uh, and a lot more sustainable regenerative farming uh, direction. Um, so yeah, this is the young woman who is continuing on the family tradition today. Uh, so let's talk about what kava is before we actually get into the uh, details, technical details of this wine. So what exactly is kava? So like I mentioned, kava is a sparkling wine from Spain. It can be made from multiple different places in many different places in Spain, but the best comes from Penedes in Catalonia. Um, and what cava is, there are other varieties that are really allowed. They're about up to about eight, but the three main ones that you really need to know, and I'm not expecting you to uh, memorize this, but if you want to, you can. Uh, it is Charello. These are all indigenous varieties. They're not really found anywhere else in, uh, in the world except for right here in Canada or in Catalonia. Charello, Macabeo, and Parellar. Uh, those three kind of make up the majority of Cava. And then there's a little bit of minority roles that are played by some international varieties like Chardonnay. This wine does have some Chardonnay in it. Um, there's some other ones that Viura gets thrown in there as well. Uh, so there's some other things there that go in there, but really what we're talking about, these three main actors, Charello, Macabeo, and Pariada. Um, it's been kind of a latest trend um, that to make these uh, these three varieties varietal wines, 100% varietal still wines. Um, there are quite a few producers that are actually starting to make those. Um, so if you're interested, it's kind of uh, actually kind of fun to taste them, uh, especially when they're not sparkling, to get an essence of what the variety is all about. Like Charello kind of gives that really good, like aromatic profile. Macabeo builds up the body. It's got the mouthfeel. And Pareada has that like steering acidity. Um, so they all kind of have a role that they play within this uh, blend. But when you're talking about Cava, we're talking about blend of these three indigenous varieties with some minority actors thrown in there. Um, so we've talked about so far uh, the first week of the Method Ancestral. And then last week, we talked uh, talked about Charmat Method or Tank Method for Prosecco. Starting this week and next week, what we're talking about is Method Traditional, Traditional Method or Method Champenois. Champagne method. So, what exactly is champagne method? So, method ancestral, the fermentation happens once, but the, um, uh, champagne, uh, the tank method, Charmat method, as well as the tradi traditional method, there's, there's a two fermentations that take place. The first fermentation is to make the wine, second fermentation is to get the bubbles inside the bottle. So, the first part is just like any other wine, they harvest the grapes, they crush it. They usually separate it off from the skins because you know they're not trying to extract tannin or phenolics or anything like that. They just want the juice. They ferment that. 
And then now you have this one, right? This is still one, still base one. And then in traditional method, unlike Prosecco method, or I mean, Charmat method or tank method, where the second fermentation takes place inside a tank, they actually put that base wine inside of a bottle. And then they usually pitch it with a little bit of yeast and a little bit of sugar, and then they cap it off. Uh, they're usually kept off, capped off with a crown cap, like a beer cap, uh, inside of this, uh, not this cork. Uh, and you'll see why, because we're going to pop that off later. And the wine, you know, the yeast in there is eating up that sugar that's in there and is peeing out alcohol, farting out CO2. There's nowhere for the CO2 to go because it's been capped off. So all that CO2 gets dissolved into the wine. And then now the wine becomes sparkling. And but what makes traditional method and champagne method special is that there's an additional aging requirement um, that is put on the wine. So after the wine sits there, they're placed on the side like this, right? There's yeast and sugar floating around doing their thing. You know, yeast is happy, eating very well. And at some point, the, the sugar runs out. Yeast eats up all the sugar and then basically dies of starvation. There's no more sugar for them to eat. So the yeast dies inside the bottle. So there's all these dead yeast cells that are now inside the bottle, inside the uh, bottle of this sparkling wine. And what they do is somebody back in the days, these days, a lot of these things are done by hand, but back in the days, they would put these bottles on the side for X amount of time. And at one point they put it in this eight frame kind of rack where the bottles are progressively turned and turned up. And then, you know, a few days later, another person, the winemaker will come by, they'll turn it about quarter turn, and then they'll turn it up a little steeper. And they repeat this process over weeks of time, sometimes months of time. And then by the time it gets up to the bottle that is standing up pretty much upright, all those dead yeast cells have been collected at the tip of the bottle. And then what they do is they take the bottle, right? This is still crown cap, right? The beer cap here. They dip it inside a freezing brine solution. And then just the tip of the bottle gets frozen. And now there's a, like this ice puck of dead yeast cells on there. And then what they do is they pop that wine off. That's called disgorgement. Uh, shooting all that, shoot, the, all the pressure that's being built inside the bottle, shoots that little ice puck out of the bottle. Now the, I, the wine is free of leaves, the dead yeast cells that have been inside. Now it's clear, it doesn't have any sediment, but it will lose some wine because all that will spill out. So usually at that point, you add, you top it off with a little bit of base wine. And this is a stage where the winemaker can add sugar. They can adjust the sugar level of the wine by adding what's called dosage. Um, you will hear this term dosage quite a bit when we're talking about sparkling wine. It's basically, it's usually made with beet sugar. It's literally just sugar, table sugar. They add a little sugar into it, just kind of balance out that, that sharp acidity that's in the base wine. Um, and then depending on that, and we'll talk about it next week, like this is next week's wine. This is brut. We'll talk about what brut means. This week, this is brut nature. You see that on the bottle? Brut nature means there's no dosage added to the wine whatsoever. So there's no sugar added. It's basically all the sugar has to be eaten by yeast and there's completely bone dry. It was not adjusted. Uh, the wine has not been adjusted and just left as it is. That's kind of the trend in the both champagne as well as cava world these days. A lot of producers are going towards a brut nature, um, kind of the having a little bit of that kind of opulence of sugar um, is a bit of an old school style, uh, which I like as well, but this more of that kind of precise laser focus acid kind of uh, expression is kind of what's becoming really popular in the sparkling wine world. Um, and then it's not done. So you add dosage, you add the base wine, you top it off, and then they put the cork on it and they, then they put the cage on the wine. And there's additional aging requirement inside the bottle as well. So after it's been disgorged, they will actually, depending on the level of the champagne or cava, they will age it additionally on a year, two, three years. It goes on and on. So that's essentially how traditional method is made. Um, 
And as you can imagine, it requires a lot of labor. It requires a lot of time, right? And that's part of the reason why traditional method or champagne at least is, is quite expensive. Um, it's just that there's that long aging requirement and um, and then there's a, a last kind of a opportunity cost or the time cost of having to hold on to the wine and not being able to sell it. So your, your cash flow is just kind of sitting in your cellar. Because by law, you just can't sell it until it's reached a certain level. Um, so to give you some of these uh, aging requirements, so traditional kava, which is mostly what you find when you go to a grocery aisle, even in a just regular store, when you see just label kava the minimum aging requirement is nine months so remember the, i was telling you about the uh, the turning of the bottles and sitting on the leaves so at minimum they have to sit on the leaves for nine months after nine months you can pop it off tap it and you don't even have to age it further you can just put a cork in it and you can sell it but for nine months it has to sit on the leaves for reserva which is the next level up from traditional kava it is a minimum of 15 months so it has to sit on the lease for 15 months at minimum. Oftentimes, producers will put it on longer, but at least minimum in 15 months. And this is usually the 15 months is when you start to see, about 13 to 15 months is when you start to see that autolytic, kind of lazy, savory, bready, that kind of thing that we've been talking about, really start to show up in the wine. Honestly, anything uh, shy of a year, I just don't think, it does something to the kind of mouthfeel of the wine, but in terms of aroma and flavor, I don't really think it does much. Maybe my palate is not sharp enough. Maybe you guys will get the least contact with it within six months. But usually for me, I it's not really the actual aromas or flavors. It's the mouthfeel that I get with the least contact up to about 13 months. So that's why it makes sense that 15 months is kind of minimum they want. Reserva is that kind of like, so traditional kava is a lot more about freshness, fruit, right? Uh, acid. Reserva is when you start to see the autolytic. There's kind of that um, uh, combination of both. And then Grand Reserva, which is what we have today, the minimum aging requirement is 30 months. So we're talking about almost two and a half years. And oftentimes they'll do it for much longer. Um, so at least for 30 months, these producers have to hold on to this wine and they cannot sell it and have to sit in the cellar. And that's part of the reason why it's expensive. Um, Starting 2017, uh, there's a new category that came out. It's called Paraje Calificado. Uh, it's the newest and the highest category created in 2017. Uh, they have all these different <clears throat> requirements. So it has to come from a delimited uh, single vineyard. So now we're talking about single vineyard cava. Uh, it has to be vinified on state. So you cannot work with purchase fruit. Uh, you have to grow it yourself. Uh, or even move the grapes. It has to be made at where it's, it's basically harvested. Uh, vines must be at least 10 years of age. Uh, they have other things like for brood, only 12 grams per liter of dosage is allowed. Uh, must spend 36 months, not 30 months. Uh, and then even after all of that, that there's this like expert panel, which are actually not made up of, this is the part that I actually found quite interesting, is that they have this panel made of non-Kava producers. So it's the not other producers from other regions that are actually judging their kava and they have to approve the wines. And then the additionally final part is that they actually have to have a full traceability from the vineyard all the way into the bottle, um, have that all documented. And it's just, a, there's been a lot of push within kava um, industry, uh, uh, associations of producers uh, that are really pushing themselves uh, for better quality uh, and really trying to compete with the champagne, essentially. Champagne being the you know most successful, the best branded wine of all time. Uh, and then these kava producers believe that their wines are just as good, if not better, but oftentimes their pricing is much lower because they don't have that brand value of champagne. Uh, and then they're trying to change that by basically competing with them in, on the quality level. Um, and I think it's a pretty, I welcome the movement. Um, I think it's the right way to go, uh, but you know, still, in terms of uh, global, but definitely in American uh, opinion of sparkling wines, kava is still seen as kind of like a cheap beverage, cheap sparkling wine versus champagne. Uh, but there's some incredible, incredible high quality kavas out there, so do not sleep on them, and it is unbelievably cheaper. It's unbelievably more affordable. It is the best 
like in my opinion, Reserva Cava is the best bang for your buck sparkling wine, traditional method of sparkling wine you're gonna find. Um, if the if shelling up, you know, 40, 50 bucks for a bottle of champagne is a, is a you know, little steep for you, um, then uh, try Grand Reserva Cava. Um, highly recommend it. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention, right? This one had a minimum, this is a Grand Reserva, so which means legally they had to age this for at least minimum 30 months on the lease, but they often do it much longer. So most Cava, most traditional method, they'll usually have a date printed or written on the label. This one, yours may be actually a little bit different, but mine is March 21st, 23. That's a disgorgement date. Almost every traditional method sparkling wines will have a disgorgement date written on the label to let you know when they popped off that uh, count cap, how long. So think about that. This is 2018, which means this was harvested, harvested in probably October, September of 2018, made into base wine in that winter, fermented, and starting in 2019, spring of 2019, this probably got put on the lease. So we're talking about 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, and 2023. So we're talking about five years on the lease with this wine. So we're talking about quite a bit of a time investment and, and care that had gone into making this bottle. So I hope you guys enjoy it because it's something special. It's not every day. You get to come across something that has been aged for five years in the cellar, constantly monitored as well. Uh, and lastly, I mentioned this already, but uh, brut mature right here, it just means that dosage, the sugar, no sugar has been added, nothing has been adjusted. So we're talking about just the, as soon as it's done, ferment, uh, the secondary fermentation is done, after it's scores, no dosage, no sugar has been added. Uh, this is a 40% Charero, 40% Macabeo, 10% Pareada, and 10% Chardonnay uh, thrown here. Um, harvested at low temperature at night. First fermentation is stainless steel tank, all temperature controlled. The second one inside the bottle, uh, it's because of Mecca Champenois, and then aged for five years under the bottle in their underground cellars uh, with a constant temperature of about 60, just below 60 degrees is basically what this wine is. Any questions about Cava or Method Traditional or Method Champenois or anything I just went over? Cool. After the disgorgement, how do they know how much wine to add back in? Is it an equal amount or can that change the flavor of each bottle? It's just uh, looking at the Looking at the bottle, they usually just top it off. Um, I mean, these days it's all done, done by machine. Um, so it's pretty precise. Uh, but even back in the days, it's basically, you just kind of look at it and you fill it back up to the neck of the bottle. Um, so yeah, conceivably speaking, if the one bottle spilled out more than the other, and then you ended up adding more base wine, flavor profile could be slightly different. Um, I would think that it's, it's small enough that it's quite negligible, but conceivably, yes. If you are very, very sharp taster like yourself, Phil, maybe you'll be able to tell the difference. Uh, anyone else? Any other questions? Can you repeat the name of the new Reserva? The, the new mod, the... Uh... Yeah, I'll will write it. Put, actually, will you put all of them in the chat, like ranking? Yeah, so Kaba, Reserva, Grand Reserva. And then Paraya Calificado should be on the bottom in that. Uh, so Kava being the youngest, Reserva being the second youngest, Grand Reserva being oldest, and then Paraya. So it's nine months, 15 months, 30 months, and then 36 months. So minimum. Yeah, I'll put it all in there. And then 36 months. You say they turn it and tilt it every, I guess, couple of days or whatever. Do they adjust it if they want to reserve it longer? So if they have to do it at least 
15 months or whatever you said. What if they yeah, want to so, do it for Yeah, yeah. So they use it, uh, it's called surlat, which is just a French word for laying on its side. So they leave it just on the side for majority of the time. And then before they disgorge it, a couple months, a couple weeks before, they'll go and start to think all this. They'll start that so process. They don't start turning, so they don't start the turning and tipping process until other Not right away. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for a while, okay. it just sits on the side for a while. Yeah. Any other questions? Have you been to this um, winery? Not this particular one, no. I'd love to go, but never, no, I've not been to this particular one, no. Mmm, love the smell. All right, let's taste it. Who wants to take the appearance? Come on. Bueller. Bueller. I'll do it. Oh my God. Oh, but I was Dave gonna do it. Dave, I don't mean to take it away from you. Just don't give oh, me well, listen, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, the, the All right, Dave. The simple part, and then you guys can do the harder part. Sorry, what? Why don't I start with the simple part and then you guys can do the harder part? Okay. All right. Uh, I think this is clear. Um, when it's clear. clear. Yep. Um, I would say it's a medium color, verging on yeah. deep for this type of yeah. one. Right. It's got some color, yeah. Um, I would say gold to left. Yeah. I agree. I, I I think this is like a verging on like medium. I, I'll call this like medium gold. Yeah, it's got some color to it for sure. I mean, it's been aged for five years. This definitely. Just so as the white wine ages, it starts to pick up more gold. If it goes even longer, it starts to pick up with like amberish, brownish color. Um, so um, this is another sign. There's obviously a, a natural varietal color. Uh, some some varieties just have uh, deeper yellow than others. But with the wines of this age, it's not. It's it's very reasonable why you would start to see a lot more kind of a gold um, color on it. So. 100% agree. Medium gold is what I'll call it as well. Any other observations? Well, there's some light bubbles in it. I would not mm -hmm. say this is FD. At the beginning, they were in these lovely strings of like uh, bubbles, but they have died off now that I have poured a glass. But I imagine that happens again later. But uh, it's not hugely effervescent, which is a preference for me. So, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at it right now. There's just like a persistent little, just tiny little like needle pinpoint. Um, uh, bubbles that are just kind of persistent bubbles that are coming up um, but yeah there's no that kind of like the almost like a beer head like a foaming action that we saw with the Colfondo and even the ancestral, uh, ancestral here so which is sign of a traditional method anything that has spent a lot of time in Southpaw excellent thanks Dave you get to pick the next person for the well, I mean, the choice is obvious, given yeah. that Liz Liz was trying to uh, take my take my easy a uh, task, so I'm going <laughs> to pass it off to Liz and family uh, for their Thanksgiving celebration. All right. Well, I just was opening our second bottle, and I was like, "Oh my God!" If Marty saw that, he would have been so upset. <laughs> if you did what? All of our eyes are intact. <laughs> did you walk away after I'm doing the cage? What did you just do? I mean, um, yeah, I had the cage on for, okay. for the record, but it was uh, it like spilled everywhere. Like it, like I couldn't none fart it. It was really weird. <laughs> so, which you know, I I had become right. out, out of my ability to do that. So that's fine. That's fine. As long as you kept your hand on there. Yeah, oh, yeah, no eyeballs. No eyeballs were lost in this, in this okay. but uh, scary, scary noise. <laughs> um, okay, well, <clears throat> nose. Dave, what I was saying was please don't pick me for the nose because this glass is like very hard to like capture all the smells, but uh, we'll do our, we'll do our best. Okay.
Um, so it's clean for sure. It's clean. Yeah, this one is clean for sure. I just want to say. Yeah, it's medium, medium plus intensity. Yeah, yeah. strong intensity. Uh, yeah. but, but again, like our our book guy is like really big here. So I don't know how everyone else is experiencing it. So yeah, mine's like a few inches off here. So yeah, I'll call this medium plus as well. Okay. Um, aromas. Oh, what do you got? Okay. Well, um, definitely some floral. Yeah. Uh, a honeysuckle or a chamomile for sure. And definitely white flowers. Um, on green fruit, uh, I had called, I, I had smelled a bit of like yellow apple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Green grapes. And yeah. green and grapes. Green grapes. Green grapes. Are the, yeah, yeah, green grapes. Green grapes. Yeah. Like a Thompson seed grapes. And yeah. a, and a yeah. very honey, honey smell. Yeah. Huh? Where does honey come in on that? Yeah, well, where would honey there, where yeah. would honey be on there on your list? Case maybe? No, but I, I mean honey will start going to it can be a lot of things, but it can be in you know, a tertiary thing bottle which ages exactly. for a while. Yeah, oh. bottle age. Yeah, it yeah, could yeah, be yeah. botrytis. Okay. It could be a lot of things. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. So the honey is a is is a more is a deeper smell. That's a okay. great yep. that's, that's a great flag. Okay, cool. Okay. Um I mean lemon, because this is a white wine, I guess we have to say. Yeah. I mean, I definitely get like the pithy, like the white part of it. Yeah, white part. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, there's something like pithy about it, but yeah, definitely some citrus for sure. What else? Stone fruit, none for me. No. None. Nope. Yeah. Agreed. Mm. Pineapple? Perhaps. Yeah? Because you're getting a lot of tropical? Like yeah. a guayaba, actually. Oh, you yeah, yeah. That? yeah. Yeah. Was it because we were drinking? <laughs> Yeah, out of these. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Um, yeah, red fruit, no, black fruit, no, cook fruit, no. How about the nature of the fruit? Do you, do you smell anything dried or old? No, I don't smell it dried. It's, it's a still more fruity. Pretty, it's pretty, pretty fresh. fresh, fruity. Yeah, fresh. Yep. Cool. Yeah. Any herbaceous, herbal, spice? No. Mm -mm. No. No. Yeah, me neither. Any minerality, any rockiness? No, and no. no no salinity. No, no. Yeah. All right, let's go to the secondary. Anything on here? Um, I mean, for sure, like some of these yeasty smells, but not but we were commenting earlier that oh, interesting, Hazel. No, it, um not a a lot of um not as much breadiness as you might get in other ones, which I actually like about this. Yeah. I know that's kind of what I find amazing about these wines is that after five years, it still has so much primary left on there, yeah. uh, which is incredible, but it's definitely starting to spit off some of this. Uh, like yeah. Fresh bread dough. Bread dough. Yes. That's what the, but also that seems fresh to me. Like, so that's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, there's a little bit of, and we'll talk about it a little bit more, maybe when we start getting the tertiary, but like there's a little bit of like a cheese rind thing going on here. Um, there's a little bit of oxidative edge on it. It's still very fresh, not a whole lot, but a little bit of cheese rind, red dough. Like, yeah, to me, it's just like yeast all over. It's like si signs of signs of autolysis. What's that? Like foot smell, like cheese rind. When you say cheese rind, is that what you mean? Like a foot? Yeah, it's, it's like a, yeah, I don't know if cheese rind is, it smells like a foot, but, you know, like old, like a Parmesan <laughs> cheese. Uh, you know, like the rind of it, if you have like, you know, I don't know if you ever save like the rind of Parmesan cheese, so you can use it for like soup and other stuff, but like that kind of rind. Um, oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So not like the rind of a soft cheese. Uh, okay, okay. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, yeah, none of these oaky flavors. No. Yeah, no, no. Uh, we know that, and then anything from tertiary here? I mean, so you already called us some honey kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, very mm -hmm. yeah, real strong honey smell. Yeah, so the honey, and then there's some. It's uh, I wouldn't as far as calling this nutty yet. But yeah, I was gonna say marzipan is a really good call. There, there's a bit of a like an oxidative edge on this wine. Um, I mean, just the amount of time is spent. Uh, so far, it's just yeah. There's a a little bit of that kind of like 
um, they're like, again, like I don't want to say nutty because that means it's fully kind of oxidated already at this point, but yeah, I kind of smell it. And then they, sometimes I get that as a cheese rind thing, uh, what I mentioned earlier, uh, but a little bit of oxidated veg here, which is totally cool. Um, but yeah, marzipan, uh, all of this, bread dough, to me, like this is screams out. Um, and then, yeah, all the still, still quite a bit of a primary that's still left on here, which is amazing. Uh, after five years, cool. You get to pick the next person for the palette. Hmm. What do you want to do? Um, wait. So, but is would you? We would say this is still developing, right? I would say so. I would okay. say this is still developing. I think it's still got a long way to go before it's fully mature. Okay uh hazel how do you feel do you want to try or you should i pick someone else sure let's do this yes, girl. all right i would like to confirm everything that was just said done no i'm just kidding <laughs> start from the top sweetness all right sweetness this why this wine is dry this wine is dry this wine is like bone dry um, yeah acidity it's got some acid yeah. for sure. I would say like a medium plus. Jesse's here with me as well and mm -hmm. has a great palate. So. Um, yeah, I would say probably medium plus for this. Ooh, yeah, it's got some yeah. acid for sure. I, I, yeah, definitely medium plus plus maybe. <clears throat> yeah, it's pulling and pulling. Yeah, this is like borderline high medium plus for sure. Tannin? No. No tannin. Alcohol. Okay. What do you think this is? uh i think medium but it it does kind of I, I feel like it tastes like it's more alcoholic than it than it is like it's it packs a little bit of a punch I yeah think. i'll call i'll call pops out for you a little bit what would you think that percentage is so is i had guessed 13 and then i looked at the bottle and saw that it was 12. yeah so about that um anytime a kava kava champagne all of that you're gonna find some air on well, anyway, between 12 and 13%. That's yeah. about what you know. 13.5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that puts us right in the medium territory, 12 to 13%. So yeah, it, it tracks. Uh, body? Body? I'm going to guess medium. I'm interested in hearing the, the spiel about mousse because I think that the tiny bubbles make it feel a bit um, lighter than it probably is. <laughs> So it's usually with a with a things with the mousse in it or with the bubbles in it. It's hard to make a unless it unless you taste it until it goes flat. The body's a little bit difficult because you know obviously the, all the carbonation gets in your way as far as the mouthfeel goes. Um, but if you kind of let it sit and come back to it, there's a bit of weight to this wine. It's not for, and you know something that has spent this much time on the these is naturally going to build out that kind of a uh, structure and mouthfeel. So I'm going to call this at least medium, um, maybe bordering on medium plus here. Uh, it's got some body. Uh, if you had just poured yourself a glass like I did, it's probably difficult to tell because like as soon as you move your uh, wine around, it's just going to fill up uh, with all that carbonation. But yeah, I'll I'm going to call this medium, uh, bordering on medium plus here. Uh, let's talk about mousse. Pay, if you have, a, if you remember, Try to remember what the bubbles felt like last week and the week before compared to what you're feeling now. Doctor. Um, yeah, I, I think that's great. Jesse mm -hmm. just said he he remembers the bubbles from last week and the week before feeling more aggressive than these. Mm -hmm. these. These feel softer. Exactly. And this is a big thing about method traditional. Like it, it's essentially, we call it creamy last two weeks. And quite frankly, that pen net was way softer and way gentler and delicate than most pen nets that would come in. Um, mm. But even then, we called it creamy. And it's just spending this much time on the leaves with the bubbles trapped inside the bottle. It just becomes just this very delicate, really pinprick little um, uh, soft bubbles. Um, and that's kind of what makes drinking kava or old kava and champagne really delicious. And amazing it's that kind of luxurious kind of delicate mousse that kind of coats your mouth so I that was agree. my first comment upon sipping it was how delicate the bubbles were yeah 
yeah, exactly. So I agree with you. I'll call this delicate myself. Uh, flavor intensity? Uh, for me, I'm getting like a medium plus on the flavor uh, intensity. It's it's oh yeah. lingering. Oh yeah, it's 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 concentrated. It's intense. All right, and then flavor wise, do you confirm everything? Is there anything else? Yeah, I do confirm everything. I was getting a bit of stone fruit. Um, I'm getting like an apricotty flavor, and I'm wondering if that's also kind of mixing in with the almondy note that we were talking about as well yeah especially on the palate i agree there's a touch of that like white flower the yellow apple mm -hmm. call i think it's a great yeah. citrus that pithy lemony thing the stone fruit this <laughs> apricot like there's something here that's fruity i you know um liz and uh phil they were talking about uh guaya uh guayaba but Maybe I'm caught, but there's something here. I, I agree with you. I don't. I can't really pinpoint it, but there's something fresh other than just green and citrus fruit here. Uh, really fresh fruit, but like, really for me. Good yeah, there's there's a there's a fruit called a loquat, which is common yeah. in the Mediterranean, and it's kind of like a pear meets apricot. Like if a pear and an apricot had a baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm yeah. getting a little bit of that. I think okay. that's probably the okay. Yeah, totally. Um, and then, but Definitely so yeah, agree with all of that. But I also, again, this is you know recalling sensory memory back from last two weeks. But compared to last two weeks, even though we have been talking a lot about this primary fruit, and there is, there's quite a bit of primary fruit still left on here, but. It is still so much more savory than the last two weeks have been. Very right? savory. I, right. Two, like the wines from last two weeks were mostly fruit, and that's kind of what we were, that's what was driving the wine. But to yeah. me, here is this kind of layers upon layers. It's not like that one thing that's driving it. There's that, this kind of a primary thing, but then it just comes in with all these secondary, and there's definitely some oxidation that, that I feel oh. here. Yeah. So, we, we both got a lot of grind. a lot of the breadiness, yeah. some yeastiness, not so much. It's more like a like a brioche kind mm -hmm. of breadiness to it. Um, and then that that like almond, I'm almond doesn't quite do it for me, but I there's something a little bit more going on here. Yeah, that's the oxidation. So if you sit with it, take a sip, just sit with it. At the very end, the back end of the palate, there's this kind of a nutty, creamy, that marzipan is, I think, is an excellent call. Um, there's a like, kind of like buttery, creamy, almondy, nutty thing that comes in. That's what happens when the wine has been exposed to some oxygen over time. And just, you know, older wines in general kind of tend to get that because they just, you know, get a little micro oxygenation that comes into the wine. Um, there's definitely some nutty edge to it, which is beautiful. Um, it starts off, you know, history with all this fresh fruit, citrus, and all those things, and then the, all the savory that a brioche, brioche, red dough, like cheese, right thing, washes over, and then lingers back into this kind of like nutty marzipan thing. Like, so it goes through this evolution of flavors, and this part of why you go through all this trouble of laying the wines on the side and doing all that thing, because to basically add complexity to add on those layers of flavor, essentially, essentially, which is only possible with time. It's not one of those things you can kind of create. It's just something that you just have to do by letting it sit there. Um, one thing I do want to mention here is that, you know, we didn't talk really talk about this minerality here. And quite frankly, like, I don't necessarily get the sense of like smell or flavor of rockiness, but it's the just the tension of the wine just the mouthfeel um, that I get with the wines that are grown in. I, I'm willing to bet, I don't know for sure, but I'm willing to bet this was grown. There's some um, limestone where this was grown. It's got this very kind of a limestone kind of a structure mouthfeel to it. Um, and I, I know, I understand for some of you, you have no idea what the hell I'm talking about, but you know, as you drink more and more wines that are grown on limestone, you will start to see what that kind of mouthfeel structure tastes like or feels like versus say granite or sand or clay um, and this definitely has that that limestone like a chalky kind of a soil 
uh, backbone to it. Um, so just want to point that out as well. Um, I feel like I taste that a bit on the side of the palate. Yeah, it's it's always uh, to me. It's always on the side of my my tongue. Yeah, for sure. That's where I feel. Um, and I do. I don't know if I miss identifying this, but as soon as I smelled this wine, my first glass, I smelled the saltiness. I smelled mm. like this, like salty minerality, not pure salt, but like. And I'm not sure whether like a I'm sea breeze. That. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ooh. What were the grapes in this again? I'm sorry, I'm, I forget. It's called Charello, Macabeo, and Pareada. Okay. It's all indigenous varieties. Um, yeah. Uh, finally, the finish. How long is the finish? Three, medium three, long. Yeah, I would say medium plus. Medium long. Yeah. I don't think yeah. it's long. I think it's I'm gonna call this I'm gonna call this long as well. I mean it's right. it goes on fucking forever. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm still tasting it. Yeah, exactly. Like that that mark spot nuttiness is still lingering through citrus still there. Yeah. I'm gonna call this long as well. How All long right. what's like the time difference in between medium plus and long? Uh, I mean, again, <laughs> there's no exact science. It's just more of like if I were to put it, I would say two seconds, everybody knows that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I don't know. Medium would be like three, five, five seconds, and medium plus five to seven, and then long seven, ten longer. I don't know. That's what I would say. Zero to sixty in our Honda CRV from two thousand seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, all right, take it home for us. How good is this wine, and would you age it? I think this wine's very good. Um, well, yeah. I think it's good to very good. It's got all of the complexity, but it's also balanced. Um, and I would drink it now, but I wonder how it might taste like in a year. I'm not sure that I would age it. Well, I don't know. Probably a couple of years. Uh, so, I mean, I saw the this one is balanced, right? I don't think there's anything that's out of balance here. In fact, I'll find this incredibly balanced. Uh, concentration, we call the medium plus on the note, medium plus on the palate. Complexity-wise, we had primary, we had secondary, we had some tertiary, uh, multiple different fruit, fruits that are not even on the grid that you're calling out, you know, like minerality. It's quite a bit going on here. So at least medium plus, maybe high, you know, high uh, complexity here. And then concentration, uh, I'm sorry, length. We called it long as well. So we're talking about balance, medium plus concentration, medium plus to high complexity, and then long finish. So when you take an average of kind of all of that, we're somewhere between medium plus and high or pronounced. So I would say this wine is somewhere between very good and outstanding. Um, I do, it, you know, this is kind of thing you would do on an exam setting. Like if I'm going to call this very good, I have to give some sort of justification of what would make this outstanding. Why would I give it outstanding? And why am I landing very good? And I think I'll land on good, very good. I think this is in the middle. I think this is past very good, but I don't think it's quite past the halfway point between very good and outstanding for me to go to outstanding. So I'll give this very good, but my justification on this thing would be, I just wish the the aromas were just as more concentrated than as palate was. Like, I think the flavors are really good, outstanding, but I just wish there was a little bit more on the nose, on the aromas. Um, and the, the actual, the length of it too, um, it, it goes long. I mean, it's already long, but even longer, I think would what would have been which is usually what I would expect from a uh, sparkling wine of this age um, or this much uh, uh, on the lead. So a little bit longer uh, length as well as more concentration on the nose would take this to outstanding, but I'm going to land on very good. But if you land it somewhere between very good and outstanding, you call it either one. I think it's perfectly fine. In terms of age ageability, I think this wine is delicious right now. I think it's drinking beautifully. It's hitting all the primary, secondary, tertiary, we talked about this earlier, this wine, like is this fully developed? Is it developing? 
The reason why I'm saying it's developing, not saying fully developed, is that I do think there's still quite a bit of primary left on here. I think there's a um, opportunity for some of this primary to convert to even more tertiary and even more uh, uh, complexity. So I'm going to say this is developing still, which tells me that this has some Asian potential as well. Just got all the acid, called the medium plus at least. Um, we got the concentration and we got the complexity. It has all the basically, it's an incredible candidate for aging longer, even though it is already been aged for five years and it's drinking beautifully now. Um, but if you want to age this, knowing how long wines like this can age, I would say this can go on for another at least probably five, eight easily. Um, and then you'll start to get really tertiary, more of tertiary notes, and then that's the primary notes and all of that. But I also think it's beautiful right now. It's just a perfect thing to drink before Thanksgiving. So, I might say, but good job, everyone. Excellent, excellent. Uh, any questions? I super hate the smell. Does anyone else? What is the smell? What do you smell? Kind of like oceany. Okay. I don't know. Yeah. And I use the same glass. Like I drink always out of these glasses. So I don't think it's a glass, but I don't know. It just smelled like very oceany to me. I really like the taste of it. Okay. But now I'm feeling like I'm crazy because no one else agrees with me. I mean, Hazel was calling out there with the ocean, ocean breeze. Um, yeah, almonds, cheese crackers with it, which is really good. If anyone got fried chicken, if anyone got like just potato chips, Oh, at that. Um, yeah, there's quite a bit of a tertiary notes here. There's that that oxidative edge. It's actually coming out even more now that wine's been open for a bit. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, all right. Out of curiosity, how many of you guys like I, this one? I do have a question. Is what there the a, a, it might be a stupid question, but it's a question. Is there a, like, a, a time you should like save like bubbles and sparkling versus steel. What do you mean? Like I've had bubble. I have a couple of uh steel like bubbles, like kava proseccos that I've had for over a year. Uh huh. That have just been sitting. Uh huh. Should I drink those now? Are they past their time? I, I mean, without knowing what those wines are, it's hard to tell. Like, like I said, like this wine, if you want to lay this down, I think it can, this will develop further. Um, okay. If, but not all sparklings are meant to be aged. Like, you know, the those like young cabas I mentioned, young proseccos I mentioned, especially proseccos, like it's not meant to be aged. Like those are all for like freshness. They're they're meant to be enjoyed young, fresh, full of fruit. You know, all that stuff. So. Depending on what it is, if it's just a young kava, young prosecco, I would say pop it open, drink it. Pop it open during Thanksgiving. It's a perfect thing. Um, how many of you guys like this one? How many of you guys did not like this one? David Corlett, let me hear it. What what was uh what's keeping you on the fence? Uh I like the complexity. I like the I like the or texture. It's it's a little too sharp for me. Yeah. Okay. So that's a that's the thing going to be. If you were going to argue about the balance, you, some arguably could debate that the acid of this thing could be a little off. Because again, again, it's because brute mature. That's the whole point of wedding dosage to balance out to kind of round out the edge. And kind of what David is talking about. It can be a little too sharp. If you're uh, sensitive to acid, the, these brute nature, zero uh, nature, zero brute uh, champagnes and cavas can be quite aggressive in terms of acidity. Um, but, you know, the people who are, the trend that's going this way now is that, you know, they will argue that, you know, this way you don't have anywhere to hide. Like if you fuck up along the way, you can't mask it with sugar. This is as raw as it gets. So only the people who are really good can make bird mature or zero color. Uh, mature color. Yeah, okay. I'm on my last class, so 
the bottle's almost gone. So, <laughs> all right, okay. Uh, it was so bad, you just had to finish the bottle, though. Exactly, just had to no, pound it though. So terrible, I had to pound it away. <laughs> okay, here, here's going to be probably everybody's favorite part, or I, I would expect it to be. How much did you think this is on a retail shelf? How much would you be happy paying for this on a retail shelf? Remember, we call this very good to outstanding with ageability, drinking beautifully with top tier complexity, top tier concentration, long length. I mean, it's, it's hitting all the marks. Still developing. Thirty-five, thirty, thirty-five, thirty-five. Twenty-five, twenty, twenty-five, thirty, thirty-five. Hazel, thirty-five. Jesse, twenty-nine. All right, and the winner is Sharice and David Corlett. This wine would be twenty-five dollars retail show, and that's what I'm talking about when I say Grand Reserva Cava is the best bag for your buck best replacement for champagne this is what i'm talking about wine that has been aged for five years champagne that's been aged on the leaves for five years would be like 80 bucks in the retail store and then compare that to 25. this is why you buy grand reserve sign us up yep this is what I mean. This is going to be my, like my house sparkling. So like, how can you go wrong with that? By the way, that yeah. 25 for you, Case Club folks, is a one bottle price. It gets cheaper if you buy more. I, I would like another, some more of this one because it's, it's really good. I enjoy, and I, but I don't have enough experience with like Kava to compare it to. But I like this bottle. So. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, next time you go to shop, ask them for a Grand Reserve of Kava. And start drinking your way through Kabbalah. Kabbalah. Yeah. yeah it's a, acid calls with cop, with sparkling because the, the bubbles get in the way. Mm -hmm. So I have a hard time with the acid calls. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, with a with acid, it's just to me, I'm paying attention to nothing else except for just the pool in my job. Like that's what I do. We try to just kind of separate. I don't even try to look for flavors, nothing else. Literally, just I'm just paying attention to the pull on the side of my mouth, uh, in my jawline, just to see what it is. But yeah, uh, there it is, folks. There it is. Any questions about anything that I went over today? I'm shook, as the young people say. All right. That's it. Uh, cool. I have one question because What's... I'm actually going back in time with Janet and anybody else. Do you do you all remember the amazing kava that we got? So, what was that? Was that just a basic kava? That was a reserva. That was a reserva. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that one was like super cheap too. That one was like, like yeah, it would have been. It was, our, it was like the house mimosa cava. Yeah, it was like nineteen. It would have been like nineteen twenty bucks. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, right? I think it was like eighteen if you got a case. But yeah. that, and, yeah, and that, we've been sad ever since oh, Janet ran out because Janet was the one who got all the cases. Yeah. <laughs> well, here we go. So now you have. Something that's would, been I aged. feel like it would be criminal to like mix this with anything. Like to make a mimosa out of this would be a crime. I don't yeah, think even yeah, I hundred I hundred percent <laughs> agree. I hundred percent agree. I don't think the flavors would go very well either. Anyway, like with the right, with the right. with the you not wine, not ever wine. mix this as a mimosa. Yeah. <laughs> only, I mean, only I was kidding, trying to only remember we had this other cava. No, only shitty sparkling should be mimosa. Agreed. But listen, you it's do you. 
if, if this is all you had and you really want Mimosa, drink fucking Mimosa. Whatever, that's fine. But I just don't think, I just think there would be a better, like Prosecco would be better for making Mimosa because it's fruity and fresh. So like, why would you want to mix this kind of savory, nutty thing with orange juice? I would be like this. I would be like this with the, with the orange juice. <laughs> That's yeah. how I am anyway. I was <laughs> like, you've never been to brunch with like 20 gay boys because that's all they do. They're like, here's 20 bottles of champagne and here's a glass of orange juice to mix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great for your mezcal. I was thinking cocktails instead maybe of mimosas. Like, Absolutely. Champagne really cocktails nice would be delicious. Cure Royale would be incredible. Well, Cure Royale. Oh, wow. It would be so fun. Mm. A savor with all that sweet. Mm -hmm. For some reason on this wine, I got the nuttiness first instead of the fruit, mm -hmm. which was really, really weird. Yeah, there's definitely oxidative edge. In there. You know, it's not everybody's jam. Some people don't like that oxidative edge on wine. I personally love that oxidative edge. Um, I'm, I'm a sucker for it. Uh, but yeah, you got to figure out whether you, you like it or not. Um, that's just preference thing. Um, but in terms of a uh, complexity, oxidative thing is definitely something that you look for because it's not something you can just happen. Like you gotta, you gotta make a point to make it in that style. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's got to spend time. Basically, time is the ingredient. Yeah, this one is so fucking good. At that price, is 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 stupid. Like price to quality ratio of this thing is off the chain. But what you're getting in the glass is it punches way above this price point for sure. Well, there you go. And then next week we'll taste the actual champagne. I mean, this is a bang or two, but you know, and then you can decide for yourself whether the price difference makes sense, is worth it for you. Um, yeah, but I think this is an incredible house sparkling to have. Any questions? Any other questions? I have a question. What's up? So the, the value on this bottle is incredible, right? It's yeah. a, it's very good to outstanding. Um, Except David disagrees, but that's mine, okay. We respect his opinion. Yeah, but that being said, it's so cheap. And if we buy it in large volumes, even cheaper. Um, what would you say is the any other comparative wines that we've had over the last, you know, th since the founding of the club, right? Since the pandemic kicked, what would you say matches this value? Tastiness to value ratio. Uh, I mean, the other, the other Kava that Liz was just talking about, that was up there for sure. I mean, in terms of uh, value wise, um, I'd have to kind of go through and look at what we've had. Uh, it's that's the one that pops to my head uh, i mean all the mary taylor wines were fucking incredible in terms of value for what you're getting um let's see i'm just looking at this year of what we had oh that fram Cinso that we had from south african box i thought was an incredible value um for what you were getting Slovenia month, a lot of that orange wines, really old orange one, that Parachel Merlot was a good one. Um, Galicia, again, going back to Spain. I mean, Spanish wines, that's the thing. Like, it's just such good values for what you get. Um, the Ribera Sacra Mencia from uh, Galicia month, I thought that was an incredible value. Um, And then from last month, that Marc Plazo, the Pearl Sauvage, the Chenin Blanc sparkling, I thought that was insane for what it was. Yeah, so. But if you're looking at entire month, oh, Charles Gonet, yeah, that $12 rosé for, for what it is, is insane. The value in that thing is incredible, yeah. 
Yeah, every year, every year we buy a lot of Charles Gonnet. Let's put it that way. My importer like hits me up every March. They're like, dude, new vintage of Charles Gonnet is dropping. You want some? Because we buy so much of it every year. You all buy so much of it every year. Uh, prefer Prosecco and Cava to Champagne. Maybe I'm a cheap date. Tell us more. Why? I don't know. I don't know if it's just the pretentiousness of it, but I just like the flavors better. I mean, they're also very different. Prosecco versus Cava. Um, depending on also the age level, too. I mean, Prosecco is always going to be really fruity and fresh. Um, unless you're getting to the Cofondo style that I was talking about last week. Cava, as you can tell, it ranges. It can be very fresh and yum to all the way up to here. But Cava freshness is like citrus, like green apple, a lot of tree fruit, kind of a fresh fruit. Um, and then uh, the Prosecco tends to be a lot more like peachy, floral, prettier, quote unquote prettier. Um, so different flavor profile. Um, but yeah, if you're talking about, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't care for the kind of savory edge of the wine, then yeah, definitely Prosecco Young Cava is the way to go. Um, champagne, just because you have to age it for longer, uh, oftentimes it, it's not, it's just not a, it's, it's not a fruit forward wine. It's a, it's, it's always meant to be a more of like an acid and autolytic flavor driven wine. So maybe that's what it is. Cool. What's everybody's plan for Thanksgiving? What did you all do? Are you guys uh, looking into all day of cooking tomorrow? Just so, like in 